starring Robert Montgomery and featuring Anita Louise. Presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Good evening. This is Bill Hamilton. Tonight, Cavalcade comes to you from Niagara Falls, New York, on the border that separates but does not divide the Dominion of Canada and the United States. Our story, Incident at Niagara, tells of a time of crisis, of storm and tension on the Niagara frontier. In the role of Jeremy Hallett, we present our star, Robert Montgomery, with Anita Louise as Mary McDermott, the girl Jeremy loved. happened over a hundred years ago when the shores of the Niagara River, boundary between the United States and Canada, were sprinkled with frontier towns and forts. Two of these on the American side, Tonawanda and Schlosser's Landing, were important to the isolated people on the frontier as shipping terminals. A river packet would start at Tonawanda, deliver its cargo to one of the islands in the river, such as Navy Island, then return to the nearest mainland town, Schlosser's Landing. This was the route of the Niagara River packet, Carolyn, on the fateful day of December 31st, 1837. And here's the story in the words of a young sailor named Jeremy Hallett. I had just returned from a long hitch in the West Indies trade. And I no sooner landed in Tonawanda than I went to the company office of a certain Captain Gore, intending to sign on as first officer of the Carolyn. Well, young man, I've heard you spoken highly of hereabouts. You've had experience, that's sure. In all weathers and all conditions, sir. Good. We sail at three o'clock for Navy Island. Here are the ship's articles. Sign your name. There you are, sir. Mr. Hallett, if you don't mind my asking... Why in thunderation did you want to come back here from the tropics in the middle of winter? Best reason in the world, Captain. There's a young lady who lives on Navy Island. Ah, might have known. We've been separated long enough. And besides, while I was away, I heard there was trouble on the island. Trouble? Nonsense. Well, your bosun told me just My now... My bosun that... talks too much. It's true that people from the mainland have been settling over there during the past year, but that simply means more cargo for us, don't you know? By the way, Captain... What is your cargo? Mister, you signed on the Carolyn to work, not to ask questions. Now get to it, will you? From the way the glass looks, we'll be heading straight into a blizzard. I stood on the bridge of the Carolyn and thought about Mary McDermott, the girl I'd been missing for 14 long months. She and her father were settled on that island. Had been since Mary was a baby. She'd be able to tell me what was going on. Oh, it's as cold as the hinges on deck, mister. Aye, bosun. Will there be men at the wharf to receive this cargo, whatever it is? Yeah, sure there will. There's always plenty of hands and eager, too. The minute we unload the cases, they whisks it away like it was hot potatoes. You've been making this run for some time, Geegan. Where are these new settlers coming from? And from all I can tell, sir, it's a rum crew, a discontented riffraff from both sides of the border. They're several hundred strong now, and they've started up their own government. Their own government? What for? <laughs> Don't ask me, unless it's true that they mean to try grabbing off some choice acreage on the Canadian side. That's the craziest thing I ever heard of. And I think so, too, but there's plenty of folks in the mainland that don't. Why, you'd have your eyes opened if you went to some of the secret meetings they're holding. They get all fired up about how the Canadians burned down Buffalo back in 1812. Talk about revenge just as if it happened last night. It wouldn't surprise me if they tried to use Navy Island as a jumping-off place for an invasion of Canada. Listen, Gigan, I've got a girl living on that island. If she's in any danger... But I know her, sir. That's Mary McDermott. And I've heard of her. I don't like to say it, but I'm told that she and her father's in on the scheme. I don't believe it. Not Mary. You have it your own way, sir. Hey! We're coming in now, so you'll find out for yourself. Jeremy! Jeremy! Mary, come 
aboard. Hurry. And watch your step on that gangway. Oh, Jeremy, Jeremy. Just let me. Let you. Here, how's this? Hmm. I've waited a long time for that kiss. Double it and triple it. That's how long it seemed to me. Let's have a look at you. Oh, you're as pretty with snow in your eyebrows as you were when I saw you last with a daisy in your hair. <laughs> Blarney. How many girls and how many ports have you said your pretty words to in 14 months? Well, now, there was a trim young thing in Gloucester. Oh, there was, was there? Yes, but she always had her mother with her. <laughs> now, give us another kiss and tell me what you've been up to. I've plenty to tell you, all right. But I hardly know where to begin. Father be coming aboard. He'll explain every to, everything to you. And, Jeremy, we hope you'll be with us. With you? Mary, I'm going to be with you from now on. Oh, thank goodness. I was so afraid you might not see things our way. You know, Father's been elected to a very important post here and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Important post? Are you saying you're mixed up in this conspiracy? Why? Watch out for that case, you idiot! Uh, sorry, Boson. Now look what you've done. The insides are spilling out all over the deck. Uh-oh. Mr. Hallett, will you come here, please? What's wrong, Gigan? Oatmeal crackers, it says in this case. But if them's crackers, I'm an Indian papoose. Ball and powder. For rifles. Hey, sir. Look, thousands of them. Mary, do you know anything about this? Certainly I do. They're for the rifles you're carrying in those cases over there. Marked dried beef. I see. I suppose everybody here goes duck hunting in the middle of winter just for the sport of it. It's land we're going to hunt, Jeremy. Land that's rightfully ours. And Gigan was right. Well, your father and his friends aren't going to get this cargo. Boys, you can knock off the unloading now till further orders. Darling, please, please don't stop them. Why not? It's obviously contraband. Listen to me, Jeremy. You've been away so long, you, you just don't know how important this is, how people feel. Why, even the Canadians want their border towns to be taken over by America. And this island full of pirates represents the American government, does it? Well, not exactly. You mean not at all. You silly little numbskull, don't you see that this could start a war? And suppose it does. You don't begin to know what war means. Uh-oh. Look who's coming. It's the captain. What's going on here? Why aren't you men unloading? Yeah, we're in for it. Where's the mate? Right here, captain. Why haven't those cases been unloaded? They're full of arms and ammunition, sir, and they stay aboard. Mister, we are paid to transport unspecified cargo. We deliver to the wharf where our bill of lading concerns it. Not by my order. It belongs to us on the island, Jeremy. Listen, don't you realize that you're just asking for trouble? If the Canadians knew an American boat was carrying contraband, they'd have good reason to open fire on us. And we passed two of their gunboats on the way over here. Mr. Hallock, if you don't give the order to discharge cargo immediately, you and every last one of these men will go to the mast for mutiny. I wonder. Bosun, men, listen to me. You've got to decide something and quick. Your captain wants you to unload a cargo of arms for the pirates on this island for use in invading Canada. Are we going to follow his orders and be responsible for starting a war, or are we going to return these arms to the mainland as loyal American citizens? You've got to make up your minds right now. I'm still captain here. I'll fall too. We're right under the muscles of them Canadian gunboats, remember? What do you say, boys? Jeremy, please, please. Sam, Coxon Blaine, iron this man. Well, Sam... Coxon, you heard the captain put me in irons. I didn't hear him say nothing, mister. Ship the gangway. You'll pay for this, every man jack of you. I'll tie on a new crew at Schlosser, and you'll swing for mutiny and worse. Mary, come with us, please. It's not too late. Oh, yes, it is too late, Jeremy. Mary, listen to me. I... Happy New Year, Mr. Hallett. I'm sure the captain will see to it that you spend it in jail. <laughs> brought the Carolyn back to the mainland at Schloss's landing, cargo and all. As soon as we tied up, the captain disappeared. Gigan and I made for the inn along with the rest of the crew to see if we couldn't do something about taking the chill out of our bones. <laughs> so it is, gentlemen, piping hot with a stick of cinema. Thanks, Jeb. You know, Gigan, if the crew agrees, maybe we can take the Carolyn on to Buffalo and drop the arms there. Eh, uh, the captain would really clap us in the brig for that, sir. If he could catch up with us. Well, happy new year. And the very best to you, sir. And if that down-in-the-mouth look you're wearing is on the young lass's account, <laughs> uh, don't I know there's no sense to a woman's ways? He doesn't understand, Geegan. I've been an orphan since I was so high because of war. I know what'll happen if a scrap starts. She doesn't. Well, you're more forgiven than I'd be, that's certain. I'd be turning her over my knee and give her the wailing of her life. Mr. Hallett. What is it, Sam? I thought you ought to know it, sir. There's nigh on a score of strangers aboard the Caroline. 
pictures are going to spend the night on it. What? It's a new crew Captain Gore hired, so they claim. He hired them, did he? That's right. Boys, listen. Quiet! Quiet down there, you! Mr. Hallett's got something to say. Boys, it seems the captain has hired some new hands and they're aboard the carol and fixing to sleep in our bunks. What do you say we celebrate the new year by going down and tucking them in, eh? Come on, let's go. Oh, mate, nobody but the crew allowed aboard, and all hands are accounted for. Sorry, Captain Gore can't sign on a new crew till this one with me has been paid off. Oh, Hallett. From what I hear, you won't be paid off. Captain Gore will have you all in the break by sunup. We'll see about that at sunup. Come on, Geegan, man. Listen here, you can't come we aboard. We can't, eh? Let's go, boys. Wait, mister. Look to starboard. What is it? Well, I can't quite make out. It's dark as the ship's hold, but like a log flow. No, sir. No, them's no logs. It's boats, small boats, a whole slew of them, right alongside. What are you talking about? Are you trying some kind of trick? Hey, look for yourself. Yeah. It's boats, all right. And they're aiming to board us. Stand by to repel boarders! All hands on deck! Here, what are you doing that for, Jeff? Why are you getting those men excited? Keep quiet. You better find out who they are, sir. Avast there. Who are you and what do you want? Lieutenant Drew of Her Majesty's Canadian Troops. Stand by, we're coming aboard. Oh. Well, now we are in for it. Easy, easy, mates. It's a tight boot we're wearing. Let's see what they want. You know your orders, men. Search the ship. Aren't you on the wrong side of the river for that, Lieutenant? This ship is scupper deep with arms to raid Canada. I give you my word, her cargo will be returned to Buffalo in the morning. Your word? Do you think our scouts hadn't kept us informed of what's go- been going on at Navy Island for the past six months? But it's going to be stopped. It's going to be settled peaceably. Oh, a sailor on a river pack is going to settle the whole thing single-handed. Ha, I have his word, eh? Stand aside. Use your head, sir. What happens here tonight could start a full-scale war. Look out behind you, Mr. Harris. That does it. It's gone in. Up. Big Dipper was pouring chunks of fire on my head, and all of a sudden I was floating along with no deck under my feet. Faster and faster and faster until I landed with a crash in the center of the North Star. Mr. Hallett, sir. Are you after hearing me? I... I just came to and found you lying there in a pool of blood. That blather skite let you have it with the butt of his pistol and creased my skull with a bullet. Where are the men? Yeah, they must have fought them onto the wharf. I can hear them back there. Hey, the ship's been cast off, sir. We're adrift, heading smack into this current. She'll go over the falls. Keegan, look aft. She's afire. Well, what do we do? We can't put it out by ourselves. Over the side, quick, before it reaches the ammunition. Right you are, sir. Come on. Here goes nothing. The icy chill of the water pulled the breath out of me, and as I came to the surface gasping, I felt the deep, deadly current. Mister. Mister Hallett. You all right? I think so. Don't let it get you. Make for the shore. Aye. Looks to me a million miles away. I swam with all the strength I had left against that current. Geegan right behind me. Hours, years, centuries later, we were sprawled on the rocky shore, gulping cold air into our lungs. I never thought we'd make it. Geegan, look. The Carolyn out there in the river. Hey, she's caught in the current. She's blazing like a forest fire. And heading straight for the falls. There she blows! listening to Incident at Niagara, starring Robert Montgomery as Jeremy Hallett and featuring Anita Louise as Mary McDermott on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Yep. Hmm? Uh, 
As for refreshments for two drowned rats. Aye. A couple of gallons of black coffee. Uh, it's in the river Allen. we've been the whole of the night, it seems. Well, they, they, they all said you was dead. Who said we were, Jeff? Them and the crew what got mixed up in that there eruption with the Canadian soldiers. Where's everybody now? It's mighty quiet around here for a New Year's morning. Oh, they all crawled back in the holes, I guess. There's no telling what'll happen next. Maybe I can tell you, Jeb. Next, you're mixing me something hot with a stick of cinnamon. Have Jeb bring mine in here to the writing desk, will you, Bosun? Sure, and there you stand, dripping wet. You're not thinking of writing a letter at a time like this. Well, this time's as good as any. Let's see now. Dear Mr. Uh... Oh. oh, dear sir. No, that's not. Hey, Gigan. Hey, sir. How the devil do you start a letter to the President of the United States? I finally did get that letter written and asked President Van Buren to send someone impartial up to the Niagara frontier. I said, Mr. President, you owe it to the American people to find out what actually happened about the Carolyn. There'll be a ruckus, ruckus in this, on this border, Mr. President. I can feel it in my bones. And everybody here will be telling a different story. Oh, Jeb, you should have seen them Canadians. Huh? Six foot tall, every one of them, and carrying cutlasses in the teeth. Is that a fact? Oh, Sure. There was at least five in our crew, laid out flat, stone dead. Five? It was near a fifteen. Wait a minute, sailor, wait a minute. As far as I can find out, there was only one man killed, and he slipped and broke his neck running for the woods. Maybe. But you got to admit them Canadians come over here and burnt up American property. And they ought to be made to pay. Yeah. As time went by, the tales got taller and taller and the excitement spread. Canadian gunboats expecting an invasion any minute were ranged along the river. They kept a close blockade and there was no way to reach the people on Navy Island. We knew as the weeks passed that the islanders must be close to starvation. I was so worried about Mary that I would have jumped in and tried to swim over. But then General Winfield Scott arrived at Slosh's Landing and sent for me. Well, Hallett, I understand you were first mate of the Caroline. Yes, I was, sir. I've been sent here by the president to straighten out this embarrassing affair. Yes, I... No, sir. I, I sent for you. Beg pardon? I said I sent for you. I wrote that letter to President Van Buren. <clears throat> that was most kind of you. Oh. Of course, he did receive several hundred letters regarding this crisis, oh. but I'm sure yours was the one he heeded. Yes. And uh, did he tell you about my plan, sir? Uh, no, I can't say he did. Perhaps he thought I ought to hear it directly from you. Well, in that case, here it is. I've, I've been thinking that since the people on Navy Island are starving, we ought to send them a ship loaded with food. What? To those renegades? I'm sorry, Hallett. I thought for a minute you might actually have an idea how to well, solve this. Not but... as crazy as you think, sir. The report has gone out that the Canadians killed several American citizens during their raid on the Carolyn. If we prove to our own people that we're alive by manning a ship with the Carolyn's crew... Sailing it with food across to the island, we'd serve a double purpose. But in the doing, you'd be sunk to the bottom of the river, son. Those Canadian gunboats won't allow any craft to reach Navy Island. They might. If you told them that we were on a peaceful mission, it might restore confidence on both sides. And what of the renegades themselves? You suggest they be allowed to elaborate their plot on full stomachs, eh? No, but I do think you'd have a hard time arresting several hundred people, especially since half of them are Canadians. Uh... I see. I see what you mean. Uh, well, young man, what do you propose to do? Well, I know of a river packet, sir. It's called the Barcelona. If you commandeered it, the crew of the Carolyn would man it. And would you take command? No, sir. No, sir. The only thing I want to see is Captain Gore in command of that ship. And how do I know this scheme of yours isn't simply a trick to get me to give myself up? They could find you here in Buffalo, Captain, if they looked hard enough. Mm. I suppose they could. How does my old crew feel about the They're idea? They're for it. The men are loading supplies at Black Rock right now, and General Scott is sending a letter to the Canadian Border Patrol. He's pledging his word that this is a peaceful mission. 
We're just waiting for you, Captain. Uh, we'd be sailing downriver under a string of Canadian guns. We ordered our course for any reason at all if we swerved in their direction, even trying to avoid a rock. Uh, they'd forget the general and his pledge. They'd fire on us, mister. On the other hand, if no incident did occur, our intentions would be proved peaceable. Is that my affair? Need I remind you, sir, that if you don't take command, we'll go to prison for smuggling? Well... That this is your one chance to be cleared of suspicion? Uh, all right, Hallett. I don't approve of it. But you may inform General Scott that I'll accept command of the Barcelona. We were ready to sail for Navy Island, loaded to the gunnels with provisions. On black rock above us stood General Winfield Scott, old fuss and feathers himself, peering at the Canadian gunboats through his glass. Mr. Hallett! Hurry up, Geegan, what's captured? Mr. Hallett, sir, I think you ought to be known. They say the Canadians are sure now that this is the start of a real invasion. They have Scott's word, but they're manning their guns anyway. If we make one false move, they'll open up. What did I tell you, Hallett? We... We'd better stay here for the time being. That is, till General Scott can write them another note, uh, uh, making the matter clear. There's been uh, no change in our orders to proceed, Captain. There'll be no mutiny by any of us from now on. Yes, yes, you're right, I suppose. Uh, shall we get underway? Aye, sir. Cast off! All right. All right. Ease her a bit, Bosun. Aye, sir. Steady as you go. Steady, sir. Rockledge, dead ahead. I can just see him touching off their cannon as soon as they mark us veer into port to avoid it. We'll have to pass it inshore and take our chances. Aye, sir. But if you'll not mind me saying so, my heart will be in my mouth a while. We're broaching bad. The day was dark, and through the gloom we could see the little flares of fire as the Canadians lighted their tapers. At any minute, they might set them to the fuses of their cannon. They're a little to starboard. Steady. Steady. Sorry, B. If we ever come through this with our skins, I'm going to be a changed man. I'm going to send every cent of my pay home to my wife. Every week. Slowly, steadily, the Barcelona plowed her way through the gray waters. I stood by the boatswain with my eye on our course and my heart in my throat. And then I heard the lookout. We'd made it. The hay was Navy Island and not a gunboat had fired on us. A few minutes after, we tied up at the wharf. A crowd was there waiting. And among them, I saw Mary. Jeremy! Jeremy! Stay there, Mary. I'm coming ashore. Are you all right? Oh, yes. And you're really here. How in the world did you manage? We saw the ship coming, but we didn't dream it was you. We brought provisions, Mary. Thank heaven. It's been so terrible here. Where's your father? Well, we, he's here somewhere. We were watching together. Here he comes, Jeremy. Jeremy, lad. I cannot tell you how glad we are to see you. It's an odd way for us to meet again after all this time. If you've come to arrest us, we're ready. You and the rest of your government? Yes. Well, I brought you a message from General Winfield Scott. There'll be no prosecution if every one of the conspirators goes back to his home. You and the other leaders of the plot will be taken to Grand Island for questioning. And after that, I don't believe you'll be held. I don't understand. After what has happened... It's General Scott's wish that the incident be closed. He feels that the less we make of it, the easier it'll be to keep peace on both sides of the border. General Scott is a kinder man than I'd be under the circumstances. Uh, I'd like to thank him personally, Jeremy. All right. I'll take you back with me. But with your permission, there's something I'd like to do first. Mary, my love? Yes, Jeremy? Come here. You've had this coming to you for quite some time now. What are you doing, my Jeremy? My boatswain claims that the only way to make a woman behave is to turn her over your knee and spank her. Ow! And young lady, I Jeremy! think he knows Ow! what he's talking about. Oh. Now, 
here's our star, Robert Montgomery. Incident at Niagara. It is good for us tonight to recall that over a hundred years ago, here on the Canadian border at Niagara Falls, a misunderstanding that might have led to war between ourselves and Canada was cleared up because of man's determination not to break the peace. Reason and vision prevailed, and the resulting century of friendship and mutual prosperity of the peoples of Canada and the United States is one of the magnificent achievements of the new world for all nations to remember today. Next week, from the Long Acre Theater, its radio playhouse on Broadway in New York, Cavalcade presents the popular young Hollywood star John Dahl and NBC's distinguished commentator Robert Trout in action at Santiago. It's an exciting radio report of the exploit of Lieutenant Richmond Hobson at the Battle of Santiago, Cuba, an act of heroism that thrilled the nation during the Spanish-American War. Be sure to listen. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade, Incident at Niagara, was an original radio play by Peter Rurick and Virginia Radcliffe and was directed by Jack Zoller. Music was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryan. Robert Montgomery can currently be seen in the Universal International picture, The Saxon Charm. This is Ted Pearson inviting you to listen next week to Action at Santiago, starring John Dahl and presenting Robert Trout. Cavalcade of America is brought to you each week by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.